movement is rehearsed again and again in a special Gulfstream jet. It's a highly modified Gulfstream II. Flies almost exactly like the space shuttle. The same descent rate, the same type of drag. Uh, just prior to landing, you're, you're descending on a 20-degree glide path, which is about six and a half times greater than what you would descend at in a commercial airliner. It's very, very important training for shuttle pilots. The shuttle announces its arrival with two sonic booms as the leading edge of the wing and tail break the sound barrier. Aided by a microwave scanning beam landing system, the pilot zeroes in on the longest and smoothest landing strip in the world. It's over 5,000 meters long, yet the difference in elevation from one end to the other is less than a quarter of a centimeter. It actually conforms to the very curvature of the Earth. Touching down, the first spaceship ever designed to fly like a plane has landed. As the astronauts adjust to gravity, the orbiter recovery convoy goes to work. For four hours, the vehicle sits cooling on the runway. Toxic fumes from the hypergonic fuels must be vented. Time-sensitive payload offloaded. And the shuttle itself must be readied for a return to orbit. Within 10 hours of a space shuttle landing, a team of 90 people at the Orbiter Processing Facility are inspecting and repairing the wear and tear of the six million kilometer journey. If you owned a recreational vehicle and you were gonna take it on a very long trip, before you did that, you would probably put it in a garage and you would ask the mechanics to check everything. When you put the space shuttle, the orbiter, in the orbiter processing facility, the OPF, you do just that. The orbiter has about six million parts, and they're all scheduled to go back up in 90 days. Every landing when the bird comes in, we check for meteor strikes, scratches that may occur on a six ten thousandths. It'll be about the size of your hair. The end of your hair, if you looked at it, that's the size that we look for on the window. The same precision goes into checking the three main engines. Each main engine is four meters long. Weighing in at over three tons, it generates an enormous amount of energy. These high-performance engines are operated at 104% of their rated power level. To maintain them for up to 55 flights, NASA had to create a roomful of one-of-a-kind tools. It's a wonderful example of the old saying, the right tool for the job. The bore scope is one of them. The engine's turbo pump is cast as an almost solid piece. So the bore scope is used to peer inside, to check for cracks on the blades that must revolve at 36,000 revolutions per minute. The aft compartment of the shuttle is um, kind of like a maze. And it's all very um, sensitive and very delicate. You have a titanium uh, thrust structure that holds thousands and thousands of uh, pounds of thrust. Uh, right next to it, you have stainless steel at a very, very thin thickness. Can you imagine being back here during an orbiter liftoff? You've got gallons and thousands of gallons of liquid oxygen flowing through this feed line, 
is coming from the external dis tank disconnect located down there. Through these feed lines, powerful turbo pumps draw liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen at a rate that would empty a large swimming pool in 20 seconds. These two cryogenic fuels, maintained at hundreds of degrees below zero, are forced together in a combustion chamber just 25 centimeters across, where they explode to produce a quarter of a million kilos of thrust. So that the engine is not destroyed by heat, it's frozen by the liquid hydrogen flowing all around it. As the engine fires, it jumps instantly to 6,000 degrees, reaching full thrust in only four seconds. The entire surface of the shuttle is a masterpiece of thermodynamic design. The underside of the fuselage is covered with a jigsaw puzzle of 35,000 individually fitted silica tiles. Each tile is numbered and cut to conform exactly to the contour of the skin. The tile material conducts the heat of re-entry away from the orbiter so efficiently that after coming out of a 2,000 degree test furnace, it can be picked up by the bare hand in just a second. As seen in infrared footage, the orbiter's surfaces were designed to withstand different temperatures. The nose cone, which sustains direct collision with the atmosphere, is made of solid carbon. Other parts are covered with heat-resistant blankets, stitched across the surface of the orbiter like a nicely fitted overcoat. But nothing required the labor or the leap of faith like the tiles. In the late 70s, it looked as if they might not do the job. 335 man years had gone into installing the tiles by the time astronauts Robert Crippen and John Young took the first shuttle ride all the way home. Well, we really had no idea what to expect, and we went to all these meetings where people said the tiles would come off. But it was really this absolutely magical piece of machinery. It uh, maintains a temperature that's outside a vehicle. On a nose cone, it's uh, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside a vehicle, the temperature is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The uh, thermal tiles maintain that. Now, when we do the simulator training, we have an astronaut crew in the actual simulator itself. We have a training crew which is, which is down at the console, and they have a script that they have written ahead of time on a list of malfunctions that they're going to input into the simulator. And then we have flight controllers over in Mission Control, and they don't know what kind of malfunctions are coming. And the astronaut crew doesn't know what's coming. In training, they pound on us incessantly. But after a while, you even get used to an environment where there are uh, uh, 20 or 30 malfunctions an hour coming at you, and you get used to it. Discovery Houston, main engine limits inhibit, stuck in the bucket. Simulation training allows astronauts to maintain a high level of confidence under an even higher level of stress. They spend a lot of training time being shaken up in this big box living through complex scenarios of disaster. That's deal a lot with the physics of the situation because engines can only do so much, the, the uh, trajectory can only do so much, you can't fool Mother Nature, and in the end, Isaac Newton always wins, and what Newton Law says we can do is what we can go do. But bodies in motion has a whole new meaning in zero G. Everything's going its own direction. It's got its own little velocity. So you're surrounded in space with all kinds of objects which are going their own way. It's incredible the freedom that, that zero G in spaceflight is. A brief sense of that freedom can be achieved in a special plane, the KC-135, sometimes called the Vomit Comet. Flying up and down parabolas, 
it sends its passengers into free-falling weightlessness. 